Well, good afternoon, everyone. You are very, very welcome to this discussion on the future of Anglo-Irish relations. It forms part of the IIEA's 30th anniversary celebration. So congratulations to everyone at the Institute. My name is Derville MacDonald, and it is a privilege to be chairing what I think everyone will agree is a most timely session on the future of relationships between the UK and Ireland. I'm sure that many of you like me tuned into the earlier webinar that Michael Collins facilitated between Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn and it was an absolutely fascinating discussion um, that spoke to many of the issues that we will be discussing today. The one advantage that we have um, over the earlier participants is that we've just a little bit more time to delve into uh, the issues but it was a fascinating discussion and you should look back on it in due course. So we're going to pick up the baton and look at some of the immediate issues of concern in respect of UK and Irish relations but we're also going to um, not quite get out a, a crystal Globe, but we are going to look a bit further down the line and look at how Anglo Irish relations could and should develop um, in the wake of Brexit. Uh, first of all, a little bit of housekeeping um, before I formally introduce you to today's panellists. Um, the format of today, I'm going to pose a, an opening uh, question to each of our panellists. They'll be given um, lots of respect and time for that, but I may have to uh, cut across them later on as the conversation advances. We're then going to have a facilitated discussion uh, between myself and the panellists. But after that, it is over to you because this is an interactive discussion. You are a critical part of this conversation and we'd love you to share any questions, thoughts or insights that you have uh, through the Zoom Q&A function. And I will try and get to them as, um, as to as many of them as possible. And um, if you can, please identify yourself when you're submitting a question. And um, uh, just to also to remind you that we're recording live. So uh, behave and uh, we are fully being recorded. And you can also get in the discussion on whatever social media platform, including Twitter, that you're on using the hashtag IIEA30. That's IIEA30. And please do, because there are many people who perhaps won't be able to join the conversation with us now that would like perhaps to take part in the debate. So without further ado, let me turn to our panellists. And I'm just thrilled as a moderator to be joined by such a fantastic lineup of speakers who are going to bring very insightful and in many cases, very, very different perspectives on the current and future state of Anglo-Irish relations. I'm going to start in alphabetical order. So we'll start with Matt Carty, who's a Sinn Féin TD for Cavan Monaghan and who serves as the party's spokesperson on agriculture. He sits on both the Oireachtas Agricultural and the All Important Public Accounts Committees. He previously served, as we all know, as MEP for Midlands Northwest constituency from 2014 to 2020. And he previously chaired Sinn Féin's Uniting Ireland Project Group. So we should expect to hear a lot about that. Next, we have uh, Dr. Katie Hayward, who is Professor of Political Sociology at Queen's University in Belfast and a Senior Fellow of the UK in, a in the Changing Europe Think Tank. She is, uh, perhaps along with Tony Connolly, uh, one of the most internationally recognised experts on Brexit and the island of Ireland, particularly with respect to the Irish border, which we heard so much about earlier in that conversation between Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn. She's an Eisenhower Fellow and she's also a Fellow in the Senator George Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice at Queen's. Our third speaker needs no introduction. It is the Right Honourable Julian Smith, who served as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland from July 2019 to February 2020, a period of time we can all agree was all too short. He's been described by some as the most successful Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in over a decade, and by others as the most successful Secretary of State for Northern Ireland since Mo Molum. His tenure was short, just eight months, but during that time, power sharing was restored and a Brexit agreement that avoided a hard border on the island of Ireland was reached. Perhaps our first question should be to you, Julian, what would have happened had you stayed? But hold on there, we'll hold that question for um, the Conservative MP for Skipton and Ripon since 2010. Finally, um, let me introduce you to Claire Sugden, who is an independent MLA for East London Derry, a seat that she's held since 2014. Um, if I'm correct, an independent unionist. Uh, she's one of my favourite uh, politicians in the Northern Ireland because she's an independent everything. But she did serve, again, like Julian, all too briefly as Minister for Justice of Northern Ireland from May 2016 to March 2017. She'd previously um, served on Coleraine Borough Council from, I think it was just for a year, 2013 to 2014, before she was elevated to higher rank. So that is our panel. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome um, to you all. And with all of those introductions done, I might sit back and relax as I ask you, Julian Smith, maybe I'll go to you for the first question, because um, 
And perhaps before we get to Northern Ireland, I want to ask you about the union, the state of the union, because like all of us, we've been watching intently and with great interest the outcome of the Scottish parliamentary elections and the success of Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP. But also in recent weeks and months, as we are all aware, there have been tensions in Northern Ireland um, with regard to the implementation of the protocol, which I know we'll speak about in full later. But from where you're sitting now um, with Brexit, a firm reality, can you perhaps give us your perspective on the current state of the union? Well, first of all, it's great to be here. It's great to see so many people that I have uh, worked with uh, before. I think Matt, I haven't worked with, but uh, Katie and Claire, um, it's great to, great to see you. Um, and look, I think clearly the union is going through uh, some challenges and significant challenges. And this was sort of always going to happen, I think, um, uh, post uh, Brexit. Obviously, when I was the government's chief whip, I was working hard to try to get a softer uh, Brexit, which I think would have mitigated some of these impacts. But it was the the, the sort of uh, Brexit process was also always going to, I think, cause uh, cause uh, challenges. I think uh, you know, in in the fullness of time, looking back at uh, how Brexit uh, you know, took place. You know, the many, many failures across the piece uh, in the UK, in Ireland, in the EU, on re resolving this issue it, it, you know, earlier uh, and on trying to uh, kind of uh, bring people together. You know, it, it's the subject of many, many PhDs. I've lost a lot of hair trying to persuade people to vote for the Theresa May, May a Brexit deal. But I think there are failures across the piece on, on that period of time. And the consequences, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the topic today, um, Irish Anglo uh, relationships have been very significant because I think um, the most difficult uh, political concept, that of trust, has um, been very challenged. And trust is vital, as we all know. Uh, you know, in the best of times and easiest of times, but particularly important uh, when we talk about uh, our joint responsibilities for the Good Friday Agreement, uh, our joint responsibilities for uh, under the Strand processes for uh, the Northern Ireland um, Executive. And I think, you know, there is now a lot of work to do, um, you know, uh, across the, the Union to restore uh, trust. I would argue there are some really good reasons to be part of the United Kingdom. But I would also argue very strongly to colleagues that unless you understand, empathise and accept uh, that many people have a different view, uh, restoring the trust uh, that needs to take place will uh, be problematic. Uh, we have to accept in Northern Ireland that that is a contested part of the United Kingdom. That was uh, implicit uh, and explicit in the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and I think then, you know, uh, you talked earlier about the, the uh, you know, persuasion of, you know, uh, many middle ground voters you know, to, to, to preserve and grow the union. It is those unaligned voters that uh, the United Kingdom needs to keep uh, making the case uh, to. And I think I would argue, unless you understand you know, many of their um, uh, sort of sympathy towards uh, nationalism, it's very difficult to actually then confidently argue the case for the union. So I think we should be very confident, uh, but there's a lot of uh, legacy damage done through uh, the Brexit, um, Brexit process. Um, and I think, you know, finally, I, I would just say that um, one of the big areas that I was very grateful for when I was negotiating uh, with Simon Coveney for the restoration of Stormont was the relationship between Ireland and the UK. I think, I uh, don't want to speak for Simon, but my view was that the best work was, was done, you know, off uh, uh, formal settings, you know, really getting to know him, getting to know all the political parties, respecting all the political parties. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we do have to do that if we're going to fully restore this uh, relationship. Thank you. Uh, thanks a million, Julian. Um, Kitty Hayward, I want to go to you next because um, probably one of those dominant themes of the earlier conversation between Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn, and I think it's widely acknowledged that it's a very unique uh, relationship. But, you know, Tony Blair said it's the basic human relationships that matter. Um, Bertie Hearn said that even in the darkest kind of hours and hard yards of opposition, they trusted each other. And we've just heard what as Julian has outlined in terms of maybe the wider UK as a whole, the State of the Union. But from a Northern Ireland perspective, I was just wondering, can you share with us two things? First, your kind of view on the state of flux of the Union, 
but perhaps more critically as you see it in terms of the impact of Brexit on though that really important triangular relationships, not just North South, but also Belfast, Dublin, and London. Um, I think that Tony Blair earlier was just expressing a really deep concern that those relations are not where they were um, 23 years ago. Thank you very much, Derville. And um, may I also congratulate the IEA on 30 years. Um, I'm gonna feel very old now in saying this, but um, it was celebrating its 10th anniversary when I was a PhD student in UCD. And at that time, I was benefiting greatly from its publications and events, and uh, it's still very much the case today. So congratulations to them. Um, I also want to say it's a great privilege to be on this panel. Um, um, thank you to you, Deb, for, for moderating it, to fellow Eisenhower fellow, I have to put that in. And also greatest respect for, for Julian, Claire and Matt. Um, I am very conscious though that I'm not a politician and so my answers to your questions are going to reflect that um, in, in that I'm going to draw on empirical data uh, radically um, as a social scientist to try and answer that question about the impact of Brexit on relationships is a really uh, fascinating question and I'm going to answer by beginning by focusing on what people have in common we immediately tend to go for what people disagree about but actually drawing on Northern Ireland Life and Times data and a recent Lucid Talk um, poll that was conducted for, uh, for us in Queens uh, on a project that David Finnemore is leading, we have some data on what people have in common in relation to where we stand now. So the majority of people, seven out of 10 people in the North think that the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is the best basis for governing Northern Ireland. That's a really positive point, I think. Um, also, seven out of 10 people think that the UK should have a close relationship with the EU. That too is really important and significant. However, there are also negative things that people have in common. So seven out of 10 people across the board in Northern Ireland are concerned about the economic impacts of Brexit and have very specific issues that they raise in relation to that. And also seven, um, six or seven out of 10 across the board in Northern Ireland um, are concerned about the current impact of, North, of the protocol, uh, particularly in relation to the political stability of Northern Ireland, and we can perhaps understand why that is. Um, they also um, think that it's having a negative effect on Northern Ireland's constitutional place in the UK. And again, that's not just exclusively for unionists, that's, that's um, recognised that it's changing Northern Ireland's relationship with Britain. And in terms of a very negative finding in terms of what people have in common in Northern Ireland, uh, the Lucid Talk poll conducted there was showing that across the board, there's very low levels of trust in the UK government. 5% of people trust the UK government to handle, um, uh, to manage Northern Ireland's interests in relation to the protocol, um, and very low levels of trust in Whitehall as well. And indeed, um, low levels of trust in the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly, even closer to home. So we see how this is a sort of a you can see how the sort of sense of precarious position that Northern Ireland is in at the moment is exacerbated by a lack of trust in those who are charged with managing uh, to, to, to move us on from this situation. Um, now, in terms of the relationships, what people disagree on, that's quite, a, uh, uh, that's quite striking because of course people disagree in Northern Ireland about whether Brexit was good or bad. Um, and also particularly they disagree now on whether the protocol is a good or a bad thing. And we see a very clear line of division on that. Um, and also they disagree on whether Irish government and the EU is responsive to Northern Ireland's needs. They're all kind of agreed that they don't think the UK government is at the current time anyway. And also they disagree on whether Brexit makes a United Ireland more likely or not. So, when we look at this, it's not just about unionists and nationalists anymore. There's a new level of difference and new types of relationships that have to be managed within Northern Ireland. And most strikingly, this falls along remain and leave lines. So even if people don't necessarily think in those terms, how they used, how they voted in that referendum has very much affected how they're seeing things working out today in Northern Ireland. And that's uh, worth recognizing because it does change us, move a slightly different position from the unionist nationalist difference. And indeed people hold those remain and leave identities strongly. So those who are, uh, say that they are leavers or remainers, six out of 10 say they're very strongly so, and that's quite different to unionists and nationalists. Um, whereas it's about three out of 10 say they're very strongly that. 
Also, really significantly, we see a very big difference between younger people and older people. Um, younger people much more likely to be anti-Brexit, much more likely to be pro, um, hoping that the protocol could be a good thing and wanting that close relationship between the UK and the EU, wanting the UK to align more with the EU rules, etc. So we see a post-Brexit context that's very different. And of course, that's because um, it's changed the relationships between Britain and Ireland. And now those relationships that you pointed to in relation to Dublin, Belfast, London, of course, it's no longer just that. What the protocol has done remarkably is mean that it's very much more now about Brussels and London. Um, and this adds to this sense of precarity, I think. And it's important time now thinking about the theme of this um, event. What can we learn from that British-Irish relationship? Um, the points that Julian was making in relation to trust building and relationship building, um, good communication behind the scenes, relationship building that can now bear fruit when it comes to handling Northern Ireland's really distinct position. Um, Lisa referred earlier on to Lisa Witten in to the per peripheral sense of Northern Ireland. Can the UK and Ireland now, uh, sorry, the UK and the EU recognise that Northern Ireland shouldn't be peripheral, even though it's a very small place, shouldn't be peripheral to their concerns that what they do has a very direct impact on this place and particularly on the generations to come. Yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to reading uh, Lisa Witten's piece, which kind of spoke to how peripheral Northern Ireland was when, uh, when uh, you know, when the UK was ex exceeding into Europe and now how um, central uh, it has become. And congratulations, um, Lisa Clare, once again. Matt, I want to come to you next, but just to pick up on something that um, he was talking about, the different contexts, the different types of relationships and that growing middle ground. Um, one of the crowning achievements, it is widely accepted of the Good Friday Agreement, was on that issue of identity of that um, where you didn't have to declare British or Irish, but in fact that you could be both perhaps neither, but that there is this growing sense of a, a unique um, identity of, uh, uh, of being Northern Irish. And I suppose um, uh, me being a border girl, I'm one of them. But looking down the line earlier, we did hear uh, Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn talk about the, how the one thing that they didn't contemplate at all in the context of the Good Friday Agreement was either a Brexit or an Irish exit, if that's the correct way to do it. But even at the present moment, even with what's happened in Scotland, um, there's no sign of a majority yet. And, you know, unification is not an inevitability. So I suppose my question to you is, what do we say to that middle ground voter who is increasingly identifying as Northern Irish and perhaps is not clinging to those old identities that would perhaps give rise to what Bertie Hearn described earlier as um, a sectarian headcount in the event of a border poll? And you're welcome, very, very welcome, by the way. Well, thank you, Dervla, and thanks to the Institute for the invite to be here and to bring, um, I suppose, a Republican perspective to the debate. In relation to identity, I suppose the simple thing to say is that nobody's identity is going to change if there's a united Ireland. And, you know, those who are British will remain British. Those who are Northern Irish, those who are Irish, um, those who are um, Portuguese and whatever the myriad of new identities that have made Ireland their home that will all be the case. I think the challenge will be to ensure that whatever one's identity, that the work has been put in to ensure that they will feel at home um, and part of the new Ireland that we're trying to build. The second point I'd make is this. The reason why I and many others want to see United Ireland is because we'll be, we believe it will be a better Ireland. We believe that through unity, we as, uh, as, as a nation will be better placed to address the challenges that we're going to face, better placed to deliver good public services, better placed um, to grow our economy and to ensure that that economy is a fair one. So they're the reasons why um, we want to see a United Ireland. And therefore, if we believe, as I do, that a United Ireland will be better for everyone who lives in it, not only then do we have a right to advocate and work towards it, we actually have an obligation as political leaders um, to, to do that. So what we're asking for in the here and now is for the planning to take place. And that's what we've been encouraging the, the Irish government and all parties to engage in the conversations as to what a united Ireland might look like and how we can actually make it um, the, the greatest success that it can be for everybody. Now, that's not to say that everybody who engages in that debate has to agree with what the outworking of any referendum, but it's in recognition that it could take place and it's in recognition of the failures of the Brexiteers who campaigned for pol politically for something for over two decades 
without any clue on the day after the referendum as to what the next step. We want to have those conversations and um, be before beforehand. So the big message that I would bring is that nobody has anything to fear from this debate. And I don't think it's logical or reasonable for people to put in place barriers for that debate to even take place. So when Bertie Ahern says that the institutions have to be up and running before we can have a referendum, I agree that it is better if the institutions are up and running. But he needs to recognise that by saying that he's actually providing um, sucker to those who would like to bring down the institutions because he's telling them if you want to avoid the Irish unity debate, then actually political stalemate is the way to do it. I don't think that's the way to move forward. So to me, Irish unity is the progressive, sensible, common um, approach position to take. I recognise that others take a different um, position. What I want to ensure is that we have the space where we can actually trash these things out, but crucially, through at the heart of this debate has to be the need to plan so that when we come to a point, and I believe it will happen sooner than many people and um, perhaps would like or realize, but when it comes to the point where we go to vote um, in referenda, I want everybody to know exactly what it is that they're going to be voting for. Thank you, Matt. And I'm going to uh, go over to you now, Claire uh, Sogden, because Bertie Hearn identified three uh, preconditions. Um, in fact, he's been talking about them for uh, the best part of two decades, uh, that, that the institutions will be up and running, that they will be planning. But critically, uh, the third aspect was persuasion. And what he described earlier this afternoon, that there would be a reasonably large proportion of the unionist community that would be amenable or open to it. And I wanted to ask you, um, it'll be a different perspective for Matt about that prospect for the middle ground, because I think the one thing that everybody on this panel will agree is that they will be critical to any to the outcome of any constitutional questions that are posed. And you sit, um, you interest me because you sit in the middle ground, uh, but you're an independent unionist, you're a feminist, so perhaps your views on social mores and other issues which agitate Northern Ireland from time to time might be very, very different from perhaps more traditional aspects of that community. But who is going to represent that unionist middle ground in any referendum, who are they going to vote for? How are they going to be persuaded? Um, and not just persuaded, but supported and reassured? Because one of the things I think that we are witnessing at the moment is certainly a crisis within unionism. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's not too strong, you know, to say that. But what what do we do about that middle ground from, I suppose, um, what I can say perhaps from traditionally what has been your part of the community, if I can put it in, in those terms, Claire. You're very welcome. Um, so I, I think it's important to note that when you become a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly, as per the Northern Ireland Act, every MLA has to sign the, the, the role as a unionist nationalist as other, and that's to ensure a fair cross-community representation in any decisions that we may take as MLAs of Northern Ireland. And I think that's important. And if anything, what that does is that the, the Good Friday Agreement, certainly for me, encourages us all to have an aspiration in relation to Northern Ireland. So when someone asks me the question, I'm going to tell them that I think that Northern Ireland remaining within the United Kingdom is the best context in which we provide public services, for example, for example, healthcare, education, infrastructure, the economy. And, but, but equally, I respect that there are others who don't share that view and who believe that uh, aspiring towards a United Ireland would perhaps be a better context within that. Um, you know, so, so for me, unionism and nationalism are basic fundamental political ideologies um, that we build on every other issue about. And I think sometimes in Northern Ireland, we get uh, too uh, focused on, on dealing with the constitutional question. When really as an MLA, on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't deal with that question. I deal with the, with the bread and butter issues, with, with the issues that are mat mattering to my constituents. So certainly from, from as a representative of people, as a, as a representative of East London Dairy, if you were asking me, how do we persuade the people of Northern Ireland toward either aspiration? We need to make Northern Ireland work. We need to look at the governance arrangements of Northern Ireland and we need to recognize what isn't working, what is working. Um, I suppose because I get quite frustrated when people often describe Northern Ireland as a basket case. It's not a basket case. You only have to look at you know, statistics you know, 23 years ago compared with now, it's not perfect, but then neither is the north of England, and I'm sure Julian can attest to that. There are issues everywhere, and as representatives of people, as, as people who scrutinise the government, we need to recognise what those policy issues are, and we need to improve them, because fundamentally, that's our job, and I believe that's what the people of Northern Ireland expect and want from us. You know, and Katie talked to, to, towards um, a confidence in, in governance in Northern Ireland. She's 100%. 
But that confidence isn't just with one community or, or, or another. That confidence is right across uh, government. And we do have a, a five-party executive at the minute, which, in fairness, I, 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 I'm not entirely content with because I don't think it is conducive to good government. And Gillian can maybe speak to this in terms of, of why that was required in 2020 in terms of trying to create some form of stability. But truthfully, I think in Northern Ireland, if we really want to move forward, and again, that's in the context of the status quo, or if, uh, if people want to proceed towards a United Ireland, we have to make Northern Ireland work. And for five years, we haven't. And you know, I, I think that underpins all the other issues that are happening at the minute, whether it's Brexit, the issues with the Northern Ireland Protocol, the, the feelings of discontent within the loyalist communities, the confidence in policing. There's so many things going on in Northern Ireland, but in 2021, we really have to ask ourselves, what do we want? And I think people just want to live happy, healthy lives. And we do that by good government. Well, listen, I am just remind everyone, just IIEA30, if you're joining in the conversation or sharing um, it online, uh, please do, and please keep your questions coming in. I know there's lots coming in already. I'm going to indulge myself as moderator, just to ask one or two more myself. And I want to go back to you, Julian Smith, because earlier both Bertie Arne and Tony Blair spoke to the risks to the safety of the Good Friday Agreement and concerns around stability. Um, as a member of the Tory party, I can't expect you to argue for anything other than uh, the maintenance of the union, but is it the Good Friday Agreement and some sort of, um, gosh, to throw even more mad terminology in, an enhanced status quo with the protocol that you think is the solution for the near and immediate term, given the many challenges, and Claire has spoken to some of them, that um, are being faced by the North, uh, people of Northern Ireland, not necessarily related to identity. We're talking about health education, you know, common threats, everything. And I suppose it's that stability question. What do you think is the best course forward um, at, at present? Well I, no, well, I think at the moment, the priority has to be on uh, the life chances, incomes and health of uh, citizens in Northern Ireland. And I think the best way to achieve that is through what is there at the moment, the hybrid solution that came through the Good Friday Agreement and which come through, comes through the protocol. The protocol is not going to go anywhere. So the best thing, the best course of action is to uh, make sure it is optimised. And for that, we need the EU. Uh, we need um, Dublin uh, to help uh, support our work with the EU and for the UK to work together to, to improve that. There are big, big opportunities for Northern Ireland coming out of the protocol. Um, you know, the level of inward investment discussions that is taking place at the moment is really high. Uh, and, you know, I think that there'll be huge benefits it's the protocol over you know, the fullness of time. But the most important thing is honesty. The, the protocol is not going anywhere. And at the moment, the Good Friday Agreement isn't going anywhere. So I think the, the best thing is to for everybody to acknowledge that and to work with that. And the opportunities that gives, uh, whatever your political persuasion, I think, uh, you know, are significant. I think on Claire's point, although the executive has been pretty challenged at times in the last year, I would argue very strongly that if we hadn't have got the executive back in place in January uh, 2020, before the pandemic struck, we would have been in all sorts of uh, difficulty. Um, and, you know, this is a unique situation where, you know, all these parties are, are, are working together and delivering. And I hope that over the coming months, the focus will be on delivery. I know there's an election coming up, uh, but really day-to-day -day governance uh, you know, as, as, as Claire's you know, implied in her comments, is key, and um, particularly as we come out of the pandemic. That's fantastic. Thanks, Julian. Um, Katie, I just want to go to you on uh, the protocol because I think it would be an understatement to say that the arrangements uh, the protocol has introduced are heavily contested and proving exceptionally challenged to implement. I see that you and David Finnamore were uh, writing recently for the Institute Montaigne and you said this would be of concern anywhere but is particularly alarming in Northern Ireland given its weak economy, fraught politics and frankly its fragile peace. And I suppose the question that arises for me for you is do we have the institutional capacity post-Brexit, post-pandemic, of course, as well, to restore Anglo-Irish relations. And I'm just wondering what fault lines have been exposed, particularly amid widely publicised or widely discussed concerns about the hollowing out of the NIO of the UK civil service and that institutional memory and understanding that um, that, I, that Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern spoke about earlier about how a whole generation has moved on and perhaps doesn't know and understand us the way it needs to be understood. Yeah, that's, that's a big question, Duffel. I mean, I'm really conscious that if there's one thing that was exposed by 
Brexit, it was in a funny way, the sort of the lack of familiarity the UK has with itself. Um, that sounds a really crass thing to say, but it is extraordinary how um, little understanding and appreciation the, 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 there is or there was um, of the Good Friday Agreement, but also of the nature of devolution. And there's sort of been, um, and this too has been exposed in some way too by the COVID pandemic as well. Um, and I know there's um, considerable work going on in the UK government, particularly the cabinet office to try and manage intergovernmental relations better. Um, but of course, Northern Ireland is very distinct in all of this because of the institutions established by the Good Friday Agreement um, and uh, therefore the considerations that need to be borne in mind when looking uh, to um, uh, manage the situation for Northern Ireland. But of course, this is enormously complicated by the protocol. And um, I think this, even if you set aside the constitutional questions and issues, and even if you set aside the trade issues, uh, fundamentally about the governance of Northern Ireland, we have a new set of challenges. Um, so in a very real way, as I mentioned, that UK-EU relationship is critical now. So the Joint Committee, whatever Lord Frost and Mara Shevkovich do, in the Joint Committee, that's that's hugely important, and that was that committee officially has um, ongoing responsibility with regards to Northern Ireland's position in the internal market of the UK, but also North South cooperation, and also on many other matters, including VAT and excise, for example. So it's not it's a it's a weighty committee, and it feels extremely remote. Um, and I think um, uh, uh, this grave question of um, what the protocol means for Northern Ireland and, and how we move on ahead from here is definitely um, exacerbated by the sense of distance between Northern Ireland and that joint committee and uh, therefore the doubts about its legitimacy. And this is why uh, this is a good opportunity trying to think positively about it all to bring in those institutions, those unique institutions that we have here, uh, North, South, East, West, as well as within NI, um, as well as the really active um, civic organizations and business representative organizations that have done so, such as Sterling Job recently, um, to bring, draw upon that expertise and that, their connection to what's actually happening here to try and best inform the decisions that have to be made at UKU uh, level. Hopefully with a mind to uh, the sensitivity and the fragility of this place, um, rather than just to their respective possibly competing interests. Yeah, and, and I think that was something that uh, the gentleman earlier kind of alluded to about how you can't just speak to your own audience and that need to spend political capital to speak to the other side. It was interesting just uh, that Christopher Salford, um, who is an ally of uh, the now DUP leader, Edin Coutts, he had told the BBC, I think it was just yesterday, there were three ways to get rid of the protocol. One, to pursue Boris Johnson to scrap it. The legal action, obviously, that's uh, um, in existence to, uh, to win it, or winning a unionist majority in next year's assembly elections. Just to stay with that, um, Katie, the continuation, obviously, of the core provisions of the protocol um, requires the regular consent of the um, Northern Ireland Assembly. To what extent do you think we will see um, uh, that unionist majority under threat if people move to that middle ground? Do you think that there will be a further electoral shift to alliance and to other parties that could perhaps maybe up, uh, upset that third option outlined by Christopher Salford? Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this, but essentially uh, at the end of 2024, in the first instance, they get to vote on the Articles 5 to 10, which are the, in the mainstay underpin the Irish sea border. Um, and if there's not a majority in favor of maintaining that, then the question goes back to the UK and the EU. Um, what's been interesting, possibly because of the nature of that consent vote and unionist concerns recently, is the emphasis upon the idea that uh, the protocol threatens Northern Ireland's place in the union and therefore it becomes a unionist concern um, exclusively and an attempt to, sorry, not exclusively, but um, it becomes seen in that way as an effort to try and um, therefore gain electoral ground in the next assembly. And this is, this is quite, uh, it, it's, it's quite a risky game apart from anything else. Um, we don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to say what people might do. So we, in this Lucid Talk poll, we asked people about this and very much it's of the case that the vast majority of people think that the protocol will affect the way that they vote in the next assembly election. 
And then we see them almost evenly split as to whether they want their MLAs to vote in favor or against articles five to 10. Um, but we don't know what's gonna happen with that soft unionist um, remain voting cohort. Um, and this is where the battle kind of lies. Will they, and I think a lot depends on what unionist parties do, but will, will those voters um, be worried about the union so they vote for, for pro-union and, and therefore anti-protocol party? Um, or will they not vote at all? And I think what the success of the Alliance Party in 2019 is very much in relation to Remain, but it's also um, because people are voting, whereas before they've been turned off. Um, so what will happen? Will they be exercised enough in support of the protocol to vote Alliance, say, or exercised enough in fear about the protocol's implications for the union to vote unionist? Or will they not turn up? Uh, and then we, who, who knows what, what might happen on that front? Claire Sugden, the um, 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement is just around the, the corner in historical terms, just in about two years. Uh, different panels will be amassed to look at big questions. But one of the questions that I suppose has really come up since um, the Brexit uh, referendum and uh, the UK's departure from the European Union is that do we now need to revisit the Good Friday Agreement in light of that, in light of the fact that the one thing that was not contemplated in all that amazing scenario planning all those years ago was Britain's um, departure from the EU? So people routinely ask, was it a product of its time? Um, do we need to stick with it? You heard earlier, Bertie Hearn, um, in no uncertain terms, saying it would be an absolute lunacy to do away with it, but he obviously being very open to amendments such as the St Andrews House or the Stormont House Agreement. Considering that sometimes the Good Friday Agreement itself can be sort of um, chucked around, people say, have different interpretations of what it means. Um, is it the right process still to go? Do you still have faith and confidence in it? Can its values hold? Um, yes, I think so. Um, I, I think it's the principles of the Good Friday Agreement is what we take forward in that it recognises that there are two very distinct uh, communities within Northern Ireland on the basis of the constitutional position of the island of Ireland. And that's still the case, you know, people still have very strong views on that. So, in, so I suppose if, if anything to, to compromise, to, to facilitate both the Good Friday Agreement, in my opinion, is the best way forward in doing that. That's not to say that the, the, the actions that came out of the Good Friday Agreement immediately in 1998 were all of their time, but maybe we create a new set of actions in 2021 that recognises, you know, where we are, and also mindful of the context of, of Brexit and, and the challenge that, ha that have come with that, because no one, no one anticipated that. I was 11 years old when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, but, and I suppose the biggest takeaway for me was that it did bring peace to, to, to Northern Ireland, and I think that's the most critical thing, and we can't take that for granted, we can't become complacent about what that means. In recent months, because of issues like Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol, it has given rise to, to tension um, and, and discontent within Northern Ireland. And, and it is because of relationships, whether those are poor, maybe they don't even exist. It maybe is that Northern Ireland has been taken for granted. My biggest concern is that in 1998, when all those people signed it, there was an assumption across the world that Northern Ireland is now fixed, let's move on. But the process, uh, it's a process, it's not an event. And I think it's something that we all need to keep working at. And it isn't just about each of us sticking to our own side. It's about recognizing that Northern Ireland needs to reconcile. So I, I appreciate there's a bigger conversation in, in, in reconciling the island, but I think we need to get back to the focus on, around recon, reconciling the people of Northern Ireland. I'm not quite sure we, we got there in the last 23 years, but that doesn't mean we can't do it in the next. So. You're making me feel old. I was 21 when the Good Friday Agreement was signed. I want to go back to you, Matt Carty. Um, the UK, um, our closest neighbour, stands between us and the rest of Europe in many respects, uh, not least through geography, but also through um, our shared history. And um, even if we move beyond the immediate issues of, of the protocol and accepting that Brexit is a firm reality, um, there's no doubt that relationships um, of all kinds will be tested through divergence and everything from finance to fisheries to to, to everything else. Uh, we know that that's going to happen and indeed it's going to prove testing and challenging for how Ireland's own relationship with uh, Europe evolves. So how do we maximise and um, best secure Anglo-Irish relations for the future given that uh, Brexit, just like the Good Friday Agreement, is not an event, it's a process? You left a nice handy one for me there. Indeed. Well, thanks very much. Um, it, it, it's actually um, funny listening because a lot of the language you're using was exactly, you'll recall the language we were doing when, um, using when we were in, in, in 
discussions, usually at an informal level, at a European Union level, when I was a member of the Parliament, um, because you know, I think it's important to say you know, and to remember where the protocol came out of. And it was uh, as a result of a very intensive, over a long period of time, set of um, discussions that took place with people from Michel Barnier right down to members of the European Parliament. And it was precisely setting out just the complications that Brexit would create for Ireland. And I've always acknowledged that even if Ireland wasn't partitioned, if we had you know, a 32 county republic, Brexit would have created fundamental problems for us anyway, because as you say, it stands between us and the rest of, of Europe. It is our largest trading partner. I'm a spokesperson on agriculture. Um, I have a constituency that is very much dependent on um, the beef sector. You know, in some of those sectors, 90% of goods go into the British market. So that's hugely important. And then we have what is called um, our shared history. It's a term I hate, I have to say, um, but it's the best one we, we have. Um, but for all of those reasons, it is imperative that you know the outworkings of Brexit work. And I think that's why you know, the DUP in particular have had difficulties in terms of mobilizing opposition to um, the protocol because everybody's preference, and this is Sinn Féin's preference as much as anybody else, what we wanted out of Brexit, if we had to deal with it at all, was essentially the exact same trading relationship that we had prior to it um, with Britain. Uh, and because we, we are dependent on having access to both the European market as well as the British market. So any divergence from that was always going to create difficulties. But those difficulties are the same for a unionist farmer from County Antrim as they are for a Republican farmer in County um, Armagh and for a Southern um, farmer in County Monaghan. So all of those challenges are real and the same is the case for SMEs and for other businesses and for particularly those sectors that want to see growth over the coming, coming years. So the problem, and this has been repeated, I suppose, ad nauseum over the past number of weeks and months, the problem isn't the protocol, the problem is the Brexit, uh, the Brexit result and the approach that the British government took um, deciding to withdraw from the single market. Can I, and, uh, can I ask an aligned question then to that? Because earlier in the conversation between Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn, we heard words like patience, trust, goodwill. We heard about, you know, the extraordinary efforts, the need for friendship, the need for trust. Um, a lot of those issues are in short supply. We heard about, you know, the, the back channels, the intense diplomacy and the extraordinary amount of effort that it took to get the Good Friday Agreement signed and underway. And for looking into my proverbial crystal um, ball, as a party that um, Sinn Féin is a party that will potentially be uh, leading, if not part of the next government in the Republic of Ireland, and possibly um, taking up the role of uh, First Minister in Northern Ireland, to what extent is Sinn Féin working to extend and network its contacts in the UK with the Tories, with other relative parties? What are you doing to build that trust, confidence, goodwill, everything that will be required to get to the next level and to ensure peace and stability, regardless of the outcome of um, any future border poll. Well, and that, that is work that we're in, involved in, and we've had an office in London since the 1990s. We have engaged with parliamentarians at that level um, through with all parties. There is a fundamental problem, and we're as well calling a spade a spade here. There's a difficulty in terms of the current Conservative government that are in power because they are not acting in a trustworthy manner. Um, and that's not just me saying that. It was one of the, I have to say, the shocks that we received, going back to my time in the European Parliament, that you would have a situation where British prime ministers, never mind ministers, would arrive in Brussels, agree to something, and before they even got home, were working at ways of unraveling that. Now, that wasn't very much of a surprise to Irish Republicans or to anybody who's followed Irish history, but it was, as I say, a shock to many people at, a, at an EU level. So there is a breakdown and a breach in trust, and we've seen this in relation to the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement and subsequent agreement in recent weeks with regard to legacy issues, that will have to be rebuilt. All I can say from a Sinn Féin perspective is we are engaged in a process of reconciliation and peace building as well as nation building. We are uh, willing and eager to engage, particularly in the first instance, with all opinion on the island of Ireland. But as I said, going back to my earlier point, we recognise that that also extends 
to the island of Britain and to political voices there. Can I go to Julian uh, Smith? I think it should be only fair to come in and respond to that. But also, Julian, um, what um, Tony Blair and Bert Heron were speaking about earlier also was just the need to de-escalate. And obviously, the uh, European Union is not without criticism in respect of some aspects of the handling of these issues. And my question for you is, how can the EU contribute to diffusing and calming the political and practical problems of the protocol, but also acknowledging the unique relationship that that the that the Ireland is in. You know, it's intrinsic to the protocol, but obviously it's not our call. I think that's what we heard earlier. It's not our call. It's obviously um, an EU competency. So, what do you think needs to happen at that? I suppose um, not even intergovernment, but really at that international treaty level between the UK and the EU to diffuse some of these issues. Well, I think, first of all, we're, we're, we're talking about the protocol as if it's all negative. I, I see a, another potential scenario, which is that significant improvements happen to the protocol in the coming months and significant inward investment comes into Northern Ireland over the coming months. The, Northern Ireland is in a unique position vis-a-vis -vis any other part of the United Kingdom to uh, maximise two major markets. And I think that opportunity will be taken and I think there will be significant improvements to uh, the protocol but the EU does have an important role it was the EU who when I was working with Theresa May uh, December uh, 2019 desperate for an exit mechanism a time limit uh, some flexibility about the uh, previous backstop refused to provide that flexibility and I do think it's really important to remember that point uh, the EU obviously is going to protect its own interests uh, but there is action it can take uh, to assist. I think obviously the UK needs to make sure it's doing everything it can in return to, uh, in, you know, to encourage that. In terms of Sinn Féin, you know, I think it is important that there is full engagement on all sides with all parties. Uh, it's also interesting to note Sinn Féin is the only British political party who has uh, members of the European Parliament. So I think even if it's just in uh, basic strategic uh, uh, interest, um, I think uh, you know, full engagement with everybody is important. That doesn't mean that you agree with everything, uh, but I think it does allow you to work through some of these issues. Can I go just to Claire Stockton? I have a lot of questions coming in, so expect um, I'm going to start going into rapid fire mode soon. But Claire, uh, a question that I have for you is that um, it's not just East-West, that Anglo-Irish relations are dependent on the quality of North-South uh, relations as well. And I'm just wondering for you and from your perspective, what does that mean in particular for this, uh, for unionism in what is no doubt a pivotal movement for, um, for the broader PUL um, community? How important are those relations? Because we've even seen the reluctance with the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference, obviously it's going to meet next June, but there have, I think, to be fair, been some difficulties. Yeah, there have, but those, those relationships are, are, are critical and are, are fostered within the Good Friday Agreement. And I think that all sides should, should look to try and strengthen those relationships, not least because of the practical outcomes that, you know, could, could happen if, if we can strengthen those relationships. You know, for example, um, Matt is the, the representative uh, for, for agriculture. And there's, there's lots of really interesting work that's happening in relation to climate change. Northern Ireland has tabled its, its climate change legislation in Northern Ireland. And there is a concern for, for local farmers that, that there could be an impact on them. So th there is cross-border working that, you know, that can really benefit uh, us all. And it is provided for in, in the Good Friday Agreement. I think it is fair to say that certainly from the PUL community, if you like, um, relationships certainly from uh, North-South have been strained in, in recent years and, and certainly previous uh, Taoiseach and, and other leaders in, in the South maybe had better relationships with previous leaders in, in Northern Ireland as well. So, you know, I, I take the point of Bertie Hearn and Tony Blair that we, we need to get back to a place where we do strengthen because we're all stakeholders here, whether it's North, South, East and West. And, you know, we are some of our parts. And, and if we all work together, I believe we all benefit. This isn't just about Northern Ireland. It's Scotland, it's Wales, it's England, and it's the Republic of Ireland. We are interdependent on one another. Matt said it himself, the biggest trading partner, you know, happens east-west. It doesn't happen outside of that. So, you know, I, I think to an extent we need to set egos aside. And I appreciate that each jurisdiction will have their own interest and will, and will fight to their own interests. But, you know, I, I think it's 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 good to recognise what the opportunities are, as well as the threats, because the Northern Ireland Protocol has issues, quite considerable issues. And, you know, where we are, are now is that on January 1st, I was quite prepared to see if we could work through those issues, but we haven't. We've delayed them. We haven't actually dealt with them. And perhaps in the coming months, as Julian has suggested, 
that we will. Um, there will be big investment in Northern Ireland and maybe in four years from now, when that uh, vote is presented to the Northern Ireland Assembly, unionists might want to stay in that arrangement because it's actually put us in a better position. But who knows? We, but we do have to work through the issues first because it's not only causing us trade issues, but it is giving rise to people's identity issues. And in Northern Ireland, that's not something that we, that we can forget. But we have to be always conscious of that because, again, it's about reconciling people as much as it is about... We, we, did hear, we did hear a lot in the earlier discussion about the risk of conflating issues of identity with ordinary issues that people um, need to work through. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Katie Hayward, I'm going to go with one of the first ones uh, to you, and it's from um, John. John Hanna. And I think it the, uh, John's question relates to, you know, irrespective of the constitutional question, um, the conditions of peace still need to be there, whether it's stability of policing, the judiciary, civicness, and those need to be in place regardless of, of what happens next. But John Hanna has a question. What advice would you have for new campaign groups in Northern Ireland, such as the pro-unity group Ireland's Future and pro-union group Uniting UK? Again, an easy question. Thank you, John Anna. But in terms of how we move forward and how we move through this, given all of these um, different nuances and the risks of conflation. I would advise them to read the uh, report of the working group on um, referendums on Irish unification that's due to be published, um, the final report is due to be published next week, I think, from the Constitution Unit in UCL. And uh, if that's trying a bit of a get out clause, I'm, I'm pulling on it because um, uh, I was part of this working group led by uh, Alan Rennick and um, containing um, former officials and academics. And uh, it was really hard work. I have to say, um, and it's a it's a big report contains a lot of um, reflection, not just on expertise within the group, but also a public consultation and uh, uh, over 1400 responses to that. And we're very grateful to everybody who responded and then responded to our interim report. Um, it's, it's quite a, an in-depth report, makes very clear recommendations. Uh, but one thing that is notable, I think, was just how much it was the case that people regardless of their views about Irish unity, um, where there's just this common concern that a, a process if handled badly could end up um, in violent conflict. And that's a, that's a concern that people had across whether they be young or old, unionist or nationalist or, or other. So um, in all of these things, tread carefully and sensitively. It's not to say you can't have these discussions by any means. It's important that they, that they take place, but just bear in mind sensitivity. Okay, next question is from um, your former MEP colleague, uh, Prontius de Ross, it's for Matt Carty. Um, Matt says identities won't change in a united Ireland, but what about allegiances? Over to you, Matt. Well, I think the lessons we've learned over the past hundred years is that a state has to learn, uh, or has to earn allegiance. Um, and the best way of doing that is through that catch cry of equality. Um, and that will be the onus on all of us as we approach and then um, pass um, um, move beyond the referendum is to ensure that all citizens are treated equally and that everybody um, receives the benefits that I believe unity can bring about. Okay, thank you, Matt. I have a question for you, Julian, and perhaps Claire, you might come in on it as well. Um, as we know, uh, the Taoiseach Michael Martin has established a shared island unit within his own department with quite significant funds to go towards um, infrastructure projects and other things to try and move that agenda forward. Julian, how has the shared island unit been received in the UK? Is there a fear that it's a stalking horse for unity, that this is kind of, you know, being used for that? Or is there an acknowledgement again at sort of that higher kind of intergovernment level that this is a good thing, the shared island unit? Well, I don't think there's been a big focus on it in, in the UK. And I think obviously there's been, I think, some miscommunication at the start uh, with the Northern Ireland Executive. But I think quite a lot of businesses, quite a lot of organisations see this as a funding opportunity, as an opportunity to uh, help support all island um, projects. And that could be climate change, it could be health, it could be uh, infrastructure. My concern at a little bit level with this discussion is we're coming out of the biggest uh, economic and health crisis uh, since World War II. Uh, the constitutional debate is not something that I underestimate, but the full priority of every politician, every leader, every civil servant has to be on getting people back into jobs uh, and getting uh, your income and uh, levelling up all parts 
of uh, the United Kingdom and, and, and Ireland and making sure people of lower incomes have uh, better opportunities. And I think that is going to come by focusing on day-to-day -day governance, the economy, uh, on winning business, inward investment, growing uh, small companies, getting more women involved in uh, leadership positions, in, uh, business organizations, getting greater diversity, giving people uh, from uh, poorer areas better opportunities training, et cetera. And those have to be the areas of the focus at the moment. It doesn't mean you can't have a constitutional view, uh, but Northern Ireland has a major opportunity. Uh, Ireland's got a major opportunity. Both the UK and Ireland, I think, can work together uh, in the best interests of people. And that has to be the priority at the moment. I mean, we've gone through the, the most awful uh, year and a half, and uh, we need to focus on, on improving that as the first priority. Thank you, Julian. Um, the question actually came from Emily Benchley. Emily, thank you for it. Um, there's a question aligned there for Claire, um, just, just to stay with that shared island um, unit. Um, and Emily asks, should, there, should it have been a shared, because we know how much language matters um, on this island, should it have been a shared islands plural, not islands singular? Um, and what is your thought um, on, on that? Yes, um, just as you were asking the question to Julia, and I was thinking that the Irish government would have been better calling it a shared islands unit because it isn't just about the <laughs> island of Ireland, it's about the island of, of, of Britain as well. And certainly if, if we're looking towards trying to uh, satisfy unionists, if you like, as well as nationalists and everyone else in between and everybody else who, you know, who, who doesn't have an opinion, then I think we need to look at it in the wider context of the British Isles and not just on this island. And, and I entirely agree with Julian. The focus should be not so much about the constitutional position, but again, I respect that people will pursue that and that's absolutely fine. But the focus at this point coming out of the pandemic, coming out of Brexit, should be about how we restabilize um, UK and Ireland because it will impact all of us. So yeah, I, I agree. It should be in shared islands and, and maybe if the Taoiseach's listening, he might uh, take an opportunity to revise that um, and, and, and speak with his counterparts in, in, in uh, London because they have a part to play too. Um, it's about all of us and, and I think that's a positive way forward. Yeah, I mean, maybe he might, if he's listening in, just put an extra yes on the end. It won't ruin all of the, the branding for it. Can I, um, before I go on, I have a lot of questions about Europe and I want to, to, um, to look at that. But can I go back to a um, really interesting question from Jean Lynch um, on education in Northern Ireland. It's one of my bugbears and the, the, the 11 plus system. And earlier today, you may have been aware, there was a report out where um, many prisoners, uh, a small group of prisoners uh, from um, you know, both communities who had uh, both expressed um, the they're concerned at how marginalised, particularly for working class communities, the 11 plus kind of that streamlined segregation system was um, and something I feel very strongly about. But Jean Lynch has a question on education and perhaps Matt and Katie, you might look at it. She says integrated, edu uh, integrated education would seem to be fundamental to improving community relations for a functioning society. It's essential that we know our neighbours. Um, since 1998, we've made some progress in multi-education education in Northern Ireland, but it has been so slow. Um, Matt, I know you didn't grow up in the same uh, system in Northern Ireland that we did with the education and probably didn't have to experience the horror of the 11 plus, but it's a really, really important point in terms of education and other services that there's still the of um, um, segregation that we have. Yeah, the 11 plus is an abomination. It's just a cruel system. And it's one of the things that Sinn Féin is most proud of in terms of our role in the executive um, has been um, the efforts of Martin McGuinness and successors in terms of getting rid of that system. I, you know, and I know there's lots of people in Dublin and elsewhere who will point the finger at um, you know, the education system in the North in terms of the dominance of religious um, orders in terms of the running them, I would say have a look at our own education system first. I come from an Ulster County as well, um, where um, there would be a sizable proportion from um, a Protestant com community um, and, many, um, um, and many would go to schools um, that are defined on re um, religious ba basis. Um, but we don't, and I think this has been the result of a lot of decades of, of work, um, have the, the same levels of sectarianism. Of course, sectarian, sectarianism is there. So therefore, I think sometimes it's an easy copper to blame education for the, you know, for the sectarianism within society. In many ways, um, education just reflects the, the problems as opposed to be 
um, the the cause of it. So it's a big issue. It's a it's it's a it, it, it's a big matter, and I know particularly in communities where there might be you know a minority um, of one particular community or another that education is seen as being very important. And I think if we were to move in that area first and say we're going to dismantle the religious um, um, ethos of schools before we've actually really tackled the root causes of sectarianism in our in, in the wider community then i think we could actually be re-emphasizing the problems as opposed to resolving them so it's a it's a huge issue i think everybody that looks at this recognizes that education has to play a part but the question is where on the where on the order of of things to do does education fall and it's a, it is a huge area that needs to be addressed it is, and obviously so is the economy. Julian Smith, I have a question from my colleague, uh, Brian Hutton from the Irish Times. He says, Julian, would you hazard a guess um, at the economic value to Northern Ireland of a successfully operating Northern Ireland protocol in terms of both inward um, and investment and access to both markets? And how would you see that working? So can you can you hazard a guess on the value of it? He also asks, within what time frame do you think um, tangible results would be seen if a successful um, protocol for Northern Ireland could be agreed? Well, I, I think it's difficult to quantify, but the sorts of things I would be looking to see are, you know, over the coming months, regular inward investment, regular uh, announcements about um, jobs, growth, uh, you know, US companies, uh, UK companies, EU companies uh, setting up in Northern Ireland. I think I don't I don't have all the detail, but I think Invest NI has seen a big uptick in inquiries. We've seen announcements from Catalyst, the technology uh, public private entity, last week of new investment uh, coming in. I think it was about 100 jobs coming from a, a London-based uh, software company, and I think there's a good chance we'll see that uh, uh, going forward. What I'd like to see is MLAs and others asking the questions of, uh, you know, Invest and I and others. Have you know have 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 we got all of the people involved in inward investment and uh, su support for business coming in and speaking to politicians, coming in and checking they've got the support, coming in and making sure that uh, you know they are fully tooled up to take advantage. And I think my overall point is there is no other part of the UK that can access both. Uh, from a goods point of view, both uh, the UK market and the EU market, and logic would 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 say, given Northern Ireland has got such great skills, such great uh, sort of uh, housing and educational opportunities, that businesses will take advantage of that. Can I ask you, Claire? There's a question from Michael Coyle, and it is in um, respect. Uh, Julian obviously had earlier mentioned that Sinn Féin is the only Northern Ireland presence in the European um, Parliament post Brexit. Um, and Michael has a question, Claire. What impact do you think um, the limited, a limited understanding of an EU, a 27 member state EU, um, and its institutions will have on Northern Ireland? I suppose maybe that that lack of representation now that 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 Northern Ireland has, um, considering obviously the majority of it, uh, wanted to stay in the European Union. I, I suppose that doesn't stop us reaching out and having those connections, particularly when we are uh, trying to encourage new deals between uh, you know the UK and and, and Europe now that we're out of that market. So, you know, in fairness, it hasn't stopped Sinn Féin doing that, all being in the UK, where they don't take their seats and don't provide that representation. So I, I think, you know, there, there are ways of doing that. And I think it is about getting back to cool heads and recognising the practical uh, actions that we need to, to, to move forward with. So I, I don't think it's insurmountable, but it does, it does, it is a two-way street as well. I think it's an important point to make. So staying, thank you, Claire. staying with trust, uh, uh, Luke O'Callaghan White has a question for you, Katie. Um, noting the low levels of that you had noted the low levels of public trust in the Northern Ireland Assembly. How do you uh, you propose, or how could uh, the inc how could we increase levels of trust, and what role is there for young people, a majority of whom, as I've just said, in Northern Ireland who voted to stay in the EU? And I suppose that is it. It speaks to your earlier point, um, Katie, in terms of public confidence and trust um, in our own institutions. Another easy question. <laughs> well, I'm just going to state the obvious, and it, it goes back to a word that Julian used before. It's about honesty and truth and information. Um, and I think um, a big part of uh, the problem in relation to trust is this sense of um, 
not being told the truth about um, really important issues and matters. And um, especially that's the case when uh, people are called upon to act or to protest or to, um, or to vote in certain ways. Um, I, I think there's a real dearth of um, uh, like um, factual information at the moment. You'd probably expect me to say that as, a, as an academic, but I think we're really seeing the, the problems and consequences of that um, across the UK at the moment. Um, and indeed, you know, if we look more broadly at the nature of politics and political debate and electoral um, campaigning, et cetera, this is a really big issue for us more broadly. In Ireland, um, we need to be aware of um, quite how vulnerable our, um, uh, our um, electoral systems are to distortion. Um, and uh, uh, this is something actually we pick up on in this in the referendums uh, report. Um, that there's a big need for reform to catch up with how information can be distorted and um, uh, how people can get very wrong uh, false impressions that can be so damaging to the things that are absolutely essential to democracy um, and uh, that these things can be very uh, have very severe negative effects quite directly and we've, uh, we've seen lots of examples of that in Ireland as I say as well as in uh, the UK recently. Can I ask you, Matt, as a former um, MEP, I have a question from um, Adrian Palm, who's the ambassador of the Netherlands to Ireland. And his question is, what role can other EU member states play to contribute to the situation on the ground in Northern Ireland to increase mutual trust between Northern Ireland and Brussels? I suppose it's maybe an inverse of the question that, that we directed towards Julian and Claire. Well, first of all, welcome to the ambassador. Um, and I, I suppose it is important to put on the record again that and I'm someone, as you know, Derville, who is, can be incredibly critical of the European Union and um, 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 especially of some of the manners in which the institutions um, fulfilled its role. And I think most of us have been critical of them over the past few days in terms of the response to what's happening in Gaza and elsewhere. But leaving all that as, aside, I do think it's important to put on the record that throughout the Brexit pro process, the institutions... Um, despite what was believed within the um, land of the Brexiteers, held firm in support of the Irish um, position and in support of um, uh, um, having a special set of circumstances that recognised the unique difficulties that Brexit presented to the island of Ireland. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, and the European Union has committed to things like the peace programme, which is crucial funding for border communities. Um, and I suppose there's, there's a bit of work that we need to continue to do to ensure that the North remains part of some of those other crucial EU funding programmes. These are funding programmes that despite what anybody might believe in Stormont or anywhere else, the British government simply won't fulfill um, the, the funding streams that were there that are crucially important. And then I suppose the other key part of the EU's positive contribution over the past number of years was when the Council, of, um, the, the Council stated categorically again that in the event of reunification, um, that the, the entire island of Ireland would remain part of the European Union. And that clearly set out the framework. It, it gave us, if you like, a clarity that the Scots would absolutely love that assurance that in the event of a referendum on unity being, um, being um, carried successfully, um, that um, membership of the European Union won't be in doubt. Um, so that's crucially important. But that the, um, the diplomatic support will undoubtedly be needed again in the event of further tensions, and particularly if the British government attempt to diverge unilaterally from the protocol. Can I ask, um, thank you, Matt, for that uh, comprehensive response. Claire, uh, before I go to all of our panellists with a final question of my own, I have a question from Joe McNeil. It's a great question. He said, uh, Claire, can the economic benefits of the protocol be separated from the constitutional position, or is it too late? Um, I think we can. Um, yes, I, I don't think the Northern Ireland Protocol and, and Brexit, even in itself, means that a united Ireland is inevitable. You know, only the people of Northern Ireland will decide its constitutional future, and that will that will depend on a number of uh, different things. But I do think it is important to state the issue with the Northern Ireland Protocol 
Um, it is ultimately a trade issue, but it is giving rise to other concerns, and, and that is identity, particularly from a loyalist working class community. And I think that's in the context of people saying that United Ireland is inevitable. And then you have this situation where, although we're part of one jurisdiction, we have um, other barriers and challenges in place that Scotland and Wales don't. You know, so I, I think it's about trying to inform, and I think Katie's absolutely right. There's an awful lot of misinformation that's that's going around at the minute, and I think politicians need to provide leaderships to inform people on the ground. But I don't think we can diminish the concerns and the other issues that the protocol has given rise to. But I don't I, I don't necessarily mean that that or think that that means the end of the union. If anything, it could be an opportunity to strengthen it. But we will wait and see if those issues can be dealt with first, and then we can perhaps take the positives on out of the opportunities that uh, Julian described. Earlier. And Julian says John Cushnan, former leader of the Alliance Party and a former Fine Gael MEP, um, has um, come up with the prospect of a Western arc. He says what happens in um, in Scotland will obviously have a huge impact on Ireland and the UK. Uh, do you think there's merit in initiating discussion and structures not only exclusively between North and South, but also between the Northern Ireland Assembly, the Dáil, and the Scottish Assembly, and the possibility of all three forming what he describes as a Western arc? of the EU if Scotland were to become independent? Would you be in support of a Western arc, Julian? Well, I think the North-South bodies, the BIC, the BIDC, all need to be empowered. And, you know, I think there are structures there that we need to use. We need to use the committees that uh, Katie talked about between the UK and, and the EU. How are we actually going to deal with the biggest challenge that we're facing, climate change, by, you know, putting up barriers? We're going to have to reduce those barriers and get the EU, Ireland, UK working really closely together. I think just on Claire's point on um, uh, unionism, some of the most um, uh, fulfilling uh, engagement I did when I was Secretary of State was with the unionist community. And, um, uh, you know, I, all I would uh, want to emphasise again is, is Katie's point that actually the more clear and honest you can be, the more we can be uh, clear that we're all going to try and improve the protocol uh, and, uh, you know, work to improve it, but that it does not threat, threaten uh, the constitutional position of Northern Ireland, the better, but that honesty around the fact that it is not going to disappear, but we can improve it, has to be uh, the key starting block, and then we, we fold in the opportunities that that, uh, that will bring. My final question to you all, and we'll have to keep it brief because I'm determined to get us uh, uh, out in time, but um, as one, I think it was Claire, or perhaps uh, Katie said earlier, Northern Ireland for all its challenges is not a failed state. There have been huge um, advances and changes immeasurably since the Good Friday Agreement and the cessation of violence that have brought about. Can I ask you all finally, just in case whatever format they'll be meeting in 30 years time at the IIEA 60th birthday, um, if this conversation was captured in a, in a in maybe in a time capsule and future generations were reflecting back. What are your greatest hopes for um, the island of Ireland and its closest neighbour? And, um, and I'll start with you, Kitty Hayward. Um, terrible. I'm not even able to think like to next week at this rate with the protocol stuff, let alone 30 years. Um, I think my greatest hope would be um, that we, well, it's going to sound ridiculously cosmopolitan, but we're beyond the, the national identities question and, and uh, not necessarily European, but as uh, Julian says, different types of identities would be much more important and uh, much more significant drivers of political and decision-making and policy-making. Um, and in many ways that would reflect possibly some of the concerns of the generation that is up and coming behind us. And it would be, it'll be such a different island, you know, regardless of the constitutional status, it will be transformed and, and, um, and Britain will as well in terms of immigration and um, various types of identities, et cetera. So it's, it, hopefully it'll be exciting to uh, imagine. Um, hopes and future and predictions of Anglo-Irish relations um, beyond Brexit, Matt Carty. Well, if we're talking about 30 years time, the one thing I'm absolutely confident of, Derville, is that we will be in a united Ireland. Um, and I'm not saying that because anything is ever inevitable. I just think that the strength of arguments um, are going to intensify um, and the demand of progressive forward looking people will be that we move in that direction. My hope is that it will be the success that I believe it can be, uh, that it delivers for every community. I hope that when we're meeting in 30 years time, we don't have to have a conversation about integrated education because it will be just, um, it, it will be an alien concept to people that we'll be talking about a health service that is actually delivering north, south, east and west 
um, on the basis of need rather than the wealth of any individual, that we have public services that deliver, that we have economic development agencies that are working together rather than back to back. Um, and that the big question when people are discussing these issues will be what took them so long. Uh, Claire, so thank you, Matt. Uh, Claire Soakton, the fear is that um, that that it mightn't be as quite as united perhaps as, as others that that there is still a gap between aspiration and reality but looking beyond that what um are your hopes for um for the future i think from 1990 until now it has been a period of transition i would hope the next 30 years maybe the next 100 years of northern ireland will be about a period of transformation in that the government is providing opportunities and aspirations and, and services so that governments northern ireland republic of ireland within the UK, the devolved nations are actually serving their people so that people can live happy and healthy lives. Julian Smith, I think um, one of the most distinctive things about you is your continued interest in Northern Ireland and indeed in the Anglo-Irish relations, despite the short uh, tenure. And I think that many people had wished it had been uh, for a much longer period. But with somebody who has got a deep and intense interest in these islands, um, what do you see as the, the future? Um, perhaps maybe not a specific outcome, but what are your hopes and aspirations for the future and for the next 20 to 30 years? Well, I, look, I really hope that the um, sort of trust between Ireland and the UK does improve. I'm confident it, it will. Obviously, the Prime Minister had a good meeting with the Taoiseach and Chequers um, last week. And, you know, there are some really, I think, positive signs. And I think things like climate change and big issues that we've got to deal with will bring us together and bring the EU together and get us working uh, closer together. Ireland's so successful internationally. Uh, the UK is obviously, um, I think, post-Brexit got lots of opportunities and I think I think things will turn out well I, I think for Northern Ireland I, I can't really predict 30 years hence but I, I think I would st strongly argue that the hybrid uh, that is in place post GFA will remain for much longer than people think that I, I don't you know predict exactly the constitutional uh, arrangement around it but I think more or less where we are now will prevail longer and that's why I would make an argument that uh, within the constitutional debate we don't leave the point of trying to improve the life chances of everybody in Northern Ireland because I think that has to be uh, the biggest focus at the moment. Young people in Northern Ireland that I met with the Secretary of State were so uh, passionate, so forward thinking. Uh, it's those people uh, that are actually the future and I think we must all work to, to support. Absolutely. Well, listen, all that remains for me is to say um, apologies to all of the questions that I didn't get to. There was such an intense engagement um, from the audience that we didn't get to all questions, but hopefully we got to as many as we could. And just to thank um, Claire, to Matt, Katie and Julian on your behalf and indeed on my behalf, because it was just a simple joy to facilitate this conversation. Um, that is it for today. Congratulations to the IIEA on your 30th birthday and uh, wishing you many more to come. Thank you for joining the conversation. Keep an eye out because there are some brilliant conversations to come uh, later on this week. And my thanks to all of the panel and to you wherever you're watching. Thank you very, very much.